So another popular specialty lens is a corneal rigid gas permeable lens. In this video, I'll go over how they're different from other specialty contact lenses. I'll look at the advantages and disadvantages to that of a soft lens and the general fitting process for a patient. Let's get started. Hey YouTube, my name is Dr. Natalie Chai, and this channel brings you the latest science-based education and treatments in dry eye disease, myopia management, and specialty contact lenses to help you understand why it should matter to you for optimal eye health, function, comfort, and even beauty. Prior to the introduction of the soft contact lens in the market space in 1971, options resembling the modern rigid gas permeable lenses were quite sparse and truth be told, uncomfortable and in some ways unhealthy for the ocular surface. However, as technology, material use, and designs continue to improve, corneal RGPs are resurfacing to demonstrate its great advantages to practitioners as a strong contender in the contact lens space. In common everyday lingo, corneal rigid gas permeable contact lenses are referred to as hard lenses. And the interesting thing is those who started with RGP wear has had wonderful success and swear by them even to this day. The tricky territory is when a seasoned soft contact lens wearer tries to wear a corneal RGP lens. Similar to scleral lenses, rigid gas permeable lenses are commonly used for the cornea that is irregular in shape, a cornea that has a high amount of prescription or a corneal disease such as keratoconus. Let's get into what makes a corneal RGP lens a corneal RGP lens. Number one, design parameters and classification of RGP lenses. Over the last few decades, the RGP lens material has become thinner and thinner to allow for this important aspect while maintaining the rigid shape to provide for good quality vision. The term corneal RGP is important because ultimately a scleral lens is also by nature a rigid cast permeable lens but of a much larger diameter. The importance comes down to the classification of the RGP and the distribution of the weight of the lens on the eye. Let's take a look at this chart here. This chart provides a great summary on the classification classification of rigid gas permeable lens associated with the diameter of the lens. Now keep in mind the average horizontal visible iris diameter is roughly 11.5 millimeters. The average corneal RGP lens is about 9.5 millimeters. Now the full weight of the lens is entirely on the cornea. Now below that you'll see there is an intralimbal RGP lens which is slightly larger in diameter at about 11.2 up to 12 millimeters. These lenses extend nearly to the limbus when placed on the eye. Again, the entire weight of the lens is all bearing on the corneal tissue. When the diameter extends past the cornea onto the sclera, there is a bit of middle ground before we truly are able to classify a lens as a full scleral lens. We start with the corneal scleral lens with a diameter between 13 to 13.5 millimeters. The weight of the lens is split between landing on a portion of the cornea and and the sclera. Now unlike a larger scleral lens, these are not intended to vault entirely over the cornea. Aside from the obvious differences in size and diameter, the most significant difference is corneal touch with lens pressure. The corneal intralimbal and corneal scleral lens all have the element of the lens sitting or contacting the cornea directly. The basics of the lens design includes, number one, the base curve of the lens, which I touched upon briefly last week when discussing the orthokeratology lens. This is a central portion of the lens and the steepest part of the lens as well. The goal of the base curve is to have it aligned with the cornea. The second is what we call the optic zone diameter. This is where the optics is the clearest. The curvature of the optic zone is actually the base curve. Now number three is the peripheral curve system. The purpose of this curve is to align the lens to the peripheral cornea to help with centration and also tear exchange. Extra parameters that we may sometimes need to consider is the central thickness of the lens. Sometimes an RGP lens may flex or bend on the eye because of the weight of the lid interacting with it. Now in these cases, at times requesting a thicker central thickness is necessary to counteract that. Now the opposite is possible as well, where we can decrease the central thickness in order to increase the oxygen permeability. Number two, advantages and disadvantages of wearing corneal GP lenses. Even though they are not as popular as soft contact lenses today, corneal GP lenses 
lenses offer a good case for someone to consider wearing them over soft lenses. Advantage number one, GP lenses allow your eyes to breathe better than soft lenses. The material used nowadays are amazing at oxygen permeability, although newer soft lenses with silicone hydrogel are pretty close. Also, because of corneal GP lenses being smaller in diameter at about 9.5 millimeters compared to an average 14 to 14.5 millimeters of a soft lens, they naturally cover less of the corneal surface. If you look under the slit lamp microscope, a good fit of a corneal GP lens is when we observe movement of the lens on eye with each blink. This movement pumps oxygen containing tears under the lens. Soft lenses conform to the shape of the cornea and have minimal movement with blink, so little or sometimes no tears circulate under the soft lens. All of these factors together reduces the risk of possible eye complications caused by hypoxia, which is reduced oxygen supply. Number two, GP lenses provide sharper vision than soft lenses. Because of the rigid nature of the lens, they maintain their shape and thus able to provide sharper vision. Corneal RGP lenses provide a more stable and accurate correction for high and irregular astigmatism. This is one of the reasons why hardcore RGP wearers find it difficult to give up their RGP lenses. The quality of vision and sometimes almost HD vision is unparalleled and non-negotiable from a soft lens. Number three, GP lenses do last longer. The caveat, of course, is always with the proper lens hygiene and care. I don't know if you've ever ran into the unfortunate event of ripping or tearing a soft lens, but that is definitely something you won't have to worry about with a GP lens. Not to say it is indestructible. However, you'd really have to be deliberate to use quite a bit of force to snap an RGP lens. Number four, GP lenses are easier to clean and maintain. Because of the material, they are less prone to protein adherence and build up over time compared to a bi-weekly or monthly soft contact lens option. The typical lifetime of a pair of RGP lens can last at least a year and sometimes even longer. Because of their long-lasting nature, it can be less expensive than soft lenses in the long run. Number five, as in a detailed discussion on orthokeratology last week, it is a form of corneal GP using the design of reverse geometry. So GP lenses are used for the purposes of slowing down the progression of myopia. In the context of the adult, it is a fascinating alternative to permanent corrective eye surgery. Sounds all great, right? So why doesn't everyone wear GP lenses? Some of the downsides of GP compared to soft lenses include, number one, the need for adaptation because of the initial discomfort from lens awareness. A new GP lens wearer may need a period of time to adapt to the sensation. It is rare that a new GP wearer is able to go a full day wearing them the first day. Most of the time, I would suggest a tapering on schedule of starting with maybe an hour or two for the first few days and slowly increasing the time over the next handful of weeks to allow for the corneas to adapt to them. It's precisely this initial hump that the majority of people are unable to get over. I know from personal experience myself, it is quite unpleasant. However, if someone is able to persevere and tough it out for the first week or so, it is well known that the general comfort is actually very comparable to that of wearing a soft lens. Number two, inability to wear part-time. Now for full adaptation to a GP lens, it is typically not suitable for the patient looking to wear contact lenses part-time as an option. If you stop wearing them for several days, you'd be restarting the process of having to tough it out over and over again. Now that doesn't sound too fun to me. Number three, increased possibility of dislodging. Because they are smaller than soft lenses, during contact sports, and sometimes even with a little bit of eye rub, one could dislodge the corneal GP out of the eye. Number four, increased susceptibility to sand, dust, and other foreign body. Because corneal GP lenses don't conform to the eye like a soft lens, it is possible that small particles can find its way under the lens. By no means is this a complete comprehensive analysis of the pros and cons of corneal GP lenswear, but I wanted to touch upon 
with some of the main points. The Corneal GP certainly puts up a good case when it comes to contact lens wear. However, we definitely do want to make sure it is a good fit for the patient when it comes to the natural shape of the eye, lifestyle, and the expectation of the patient. Number three. Lastly, we'll look at the general fitting process of the corneal GP. Now, there are a lot of similarities to fitting the corneal GP to that of fitting the scleral lens. I walked you through how optometrists typically would diagnostically fit a scleral lens in a previous video of mine here. Now, because the corneal GP does sit on the cornea directly, an empirical fit using corneal topography is nowadays a viable and highly successful option. In other words, we can now have the option to design a corneal GP lens directly from the information off the corneal topography captures. The amazing thing is it is very accurate with most times achieving first fit success. Not to mention, this significantly reduces the time required for the initial fitting process for the optometrist or ophthalmologist when we talk about chair time. Once we receive the lens from the manufacturing lab, we insert the lens to assess the fit and as usual, we install the sodium fluorescein dye to better visualize the fit when we look into the slit lamp microscope. Before assessing the fit, however, we must allow the corneal RGP lens to settle on the eye for at least 30 minutes. Now, this allows us to observe the true relationship of the lens on eye and better demonstrates the possible day-to-day -day experience for the patient. A few things we are looking for include A alignment fit or apical alignment. We are looking for a fluorescein pattern where it shows the lens evenly contouring the cornea centrally with light tear pooling between the lens and the cornea. In the event that the lens is too steep, one may observe a bright green pattern centrally. When the GP lens is too shallow or too flat, the pupil and iris is visible, or sometimes there is a black appearance centrally with peripheral or side clearance. Now this is termed apical bearing. Both of these are not ideal situations and is considered a poor cornea to lens fitting relationship. And B, edge lift or peripheral clearance. This is very important as this allows for good tear flow and centrating the lens as best as possible. We are looking for a narrow band of edge clearance. And C, dynamic fit. What we mean here is that we do expect the corneal GP to move on blink to again allow for tear exchange. We expect the lens to move about 1.5 to 2 millimeters with each blink up and down in the vertical plane at the 12 and 6 o'clock position. D. Centration. Even though the GP lens moves on the eye with blink, we are looking to make sure that it remains relatively centered over the pupil when the patient is looking straight ahead. This is known as primary gaze. Well, the lens should remain on the cornea during all positions of gaze to minimize the undesirable conjunctival staining from the edge of the lens. The modality of the intralimbal GP actually increases the diameter, typically to help with better centration. Now, a larger overall diameter lens also helps with the initial comfort of the lens on the eye for the patient. Once we observe and are satisfied with the initial fit of the RGP lens, we send the patient home after training on insertion removal and hygiene education for about a week. At the follow-up appointments, we are re-evaluating all the above parameters as now the RGP lens has had the chance to settle more onto the patient's cornea and sometimes what we saw at the initial assessment can be entirely different. This visit is also very important as we have a conversation on the patient's experience and to unpack any issues or concerns they may have with their RGP lens. So there you go. There are a lot of advantages over the soft contact lens route. However, the initial discomfort is usually the biggest hurdle for most people, especially if someone has been accustomed to the immediate comfort of a soft lens. To address this issue, there are other specialty contact lenses out there known as hybrid contact lenses, where it combines a hard lens center and a soft lens skirt around it. So it provides the crisp, clear vision of a corneal GP while providing the comfort of a soft lens. Look forward to a future video on these exciting specialty lenses. That's it for me today. I hope you learned something about corneal GP and have a better understanding around them. Now, they usually get a pretty bad rap if someone talks about them in passing, but hopefully I've changed your mind. Maybe a little? If you enjoyed today's video and like to learn more about these amazing specialty contact lenses, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell to make sure you don't miss my new YouTube
YouTube video every Thursday. Take care of your eyes, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.